instead of trying out the various parameters one by one, the various kernels one by one, what we can do is we, we can use a, use a concept called grid search. Scikit-learn gives you a facility of using a concept called grid search. So I'm going to use that. This one which I'm using is grid search with cross validation. Grid search CV, not even grid search. There are different types of grid search, random grid search, so on and so forth. I'm using grid search CV. What I'm doing here is, first I'll take you to the grid. I'm preparing a grid. A grid is nothing but a table in which you have all the parameters, hyperparameters in the first column and the range of values that this hyperparameter can take in the second column. Then what I'm doing here is classifier gamma values I'm setting a range and the C value I'm setting a range. What this is going to do is, what this grid search is going to do is, I can show you only three dimensions. So it's going to have one dimension called C, other dimension called gamma, and this dimension called, uh, let's take it as classifier. Different classifiers, RBF, poly, and all. Now amongst all these combinations in this, in this mathematical space, it's going to find out for you what is the best combination which gives you minimal error in your data, in your test. So let's assume this dimension we have error. So what is the combination of this Q and C which give me the least error in your test data? This combination, it's just like the best fit line, it's going to find out this best combination for you by running across all these values, this particular algorithm. So you can use it for any model, I'm just showing you for this, the port vector machines. So I'm prepa preparing a param grid, you can call it anything you like. It is a key value pair where the key is the parameter, the values are the various values it's, it's, it's going to take. Pipeline, I'm using a pipeline object here. Whenever you do any transformation to your data set before building the model, whatever transformations you do, if you have series of transformations, the same transformations have to be applied in the production data also. Very likely that in production when you're running, you may slip or miss some of the steps. To prevent such mistakes, scikit-learn gives you an object called pipeline. So in the pipeline itself, you start defining your stages and at each stage what algorithm, what, what tool, tool you are using, standard scalar for instance, you can put it inside the pipeline. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is, I'm creating grid. And then I'm using this grid search CV. The grid search CV executes whatever is there in the pipe, followed by these parameters that are given. So that SVC will be for executed on all these parameters. And I'm saying CV cross validation is five. You can call it, you can take anything like. What is this cross validation? You're breaking your data into training set, test set. Instead of doing that, you break your data into, in this case, five pieces. One, two, three, four, five. It will train your model on four. Test your model on this. Once this is done, it will loop, loop back. Again, train your model on some other four and test on this. So this exercise will happen five times. Each time it will take a different five, different four and test on the fifth. So five times the models will be created. Five accuracy reports will be given to you. Average it out. That is the overall average accuracy of the model you, you can expect in production. The validation will happen inside the k-fold because hyperparameters are being changed there. Then take Check the model on test. Basically, the sanctity of the test data should never be spoiled. Whenever you do Z scoring or any kind of transformation, you remember I told you once that people often do a very innocent mistake. Break your data into tests and other. Don't touch this at all. On this, you do K fold. Call this test into your grids. Uh, grid score dot fit, whatever it is, call it here. 
when you do this, this will apply the pipeline on this test data. In the pipeline, you have a standard scalar. So this will be converted into separate Z scores. This will be converted into separate Z scores. The two will be Z scored independent of each other. The innocent mistake that we do is, we first convert the entire data set into Z score. Then we break it into test set, training set. Test set has already been influenced by training set. The test set has already been influenced by the values in the training set. You may notice that when you run your support vector classifiers with RBF functions and you don't set the random state, every time you run it, it will give you different results. It will give you different results because internally to solve that optimization problem, random function is used. The dual problem which you talked about, random function is used. So keep in mind, all models will give you some performance in a range. They will never give you point estimates. Going with point estimates is a disaster. You should always go with range estimates. And the range should not be too wide. It should be within certain limits. That is where we come to what is called bootstrap sampling. Okay? In bootstrap sampling, what happens is, have you heard of this bootstrap sample? Suppose I had Suppose I have 15 people in this class. Suppose, I don't know how many are there. Suppose 15 people in the class. Out of this 15 people in the class, I can create 15 samples. One, two, three, four. What will be the sample size? Now, sample size can be 15. I can create 15 samples of 15 sample size. Then you might be thinking one will be the mirror image of the other, not necessary. Bootstrap sampling is sampling with, with replacement and using random function. So you take randomly pick up one record, put it here. Go back and take randomly pick up one record, put it here. Take randomly one record, put it here. You might be having duplicates. You might be having triplicates. Do that exercise for all of them. They are unlikely to be 100% equal, but there will be a lot of overlap between them, no doubt. Okay? On this bootstrap sampling, you run your models against each one of them. You run your models on each one of them. What will happen is, the advantage of running bootstrap sampling is, when you have many samples like this, you will see that the performance of your model across all these samples varies. There is variance in the performance. But you will see that the distribution of the variance acquires a normal curve property. This concept you would have heard in statistics is called central limit theorem. Central limit theorem. So when I do bootstrap sampling with my model, I take advantage of central limit theorem and as a result of which, when I distribute, plot the distribution of the accuracies on each one of these, the plot tends to take a normal shape, theoretical normal. The larger the number of samples, more normal it will be. Plus, this is going to tell you what is the likely performance in production with Lower and up, lower control limit, upper control limit, and confidence level. Confidence level by default is always 95. So this bootstrap sampling will give you at 95% confidence. What is the least performance you're likely to get? What is the max performance you're likely to get in production? This plot, this plot is frequency. You can actually, it's, if you plot histogram, it's frequency. Otherwise, it's density. Okay. So this plot can will come out as your uh, what you call histograms, vertical histograms. Okay, you'll find histograms here. What you're seeing here is frequency. How many times your model gave me this scores in the bootstrap sample? So when you run this n number of times, the histogram tends to become a normal curve. So you get to know what is the production per performance likely to be, and what is the lower performance, what is upper performance. The reason why it's called 63.2% sampling is if I have n data points here, 
what is the probability that a particular record will get selected for a sample? Nye Bayes cluster, we all must remember this. What is the probability that a particular record will get selected for in the sample? What is the probability that a record will not get selected? Correct, correct. When I'm creating this data and when creating this data, are the probabilities somehow interrelated? Are they influencing each other? They are independent probability. Probability that a record will not get selected at all in any of these samples can happen, right? That is raised to the power n. This expression, when n tends towards infinity, this expression tends to become 1 by 1 minus e. Value 8 comes to 63.2%. Hence, it is known as 63.2% sampling, which means you will always be left with uh, 37, 36.8, something around that, percent of the data unused by your bootstrap. The 36 point whatever percent is left unused by your bootstrapping, that is used for testing. That bootstrapping automatically uses for testing. 